Okay, uh, so we'll start and we'll get going. Okay, right. So we'll start with unit number three. Unit number three is on uh, government intervention. Okay, uh, so if you look at the previous syllabus, that is 2018 and before, you all know unit number two and three was considered as one unit, right? So when I was doing A levels, unit number two is a huge unit that has taxes, subsidies, demand, supply, everything. So therefore, in the previous papers, you usually get only one essay question from unit number two and three both. But now in the new syllabus, that is from 2019 onwards, since unit number three is a separate unit, you get one entire essay question from unit number three. So if you look at the papers 2019, 20, 21, you will see the third question of your paper is from unit number three. So if that is the case, right? Uh, so I have explained that story and the most probable question, now usual questions are there guys, taxes, all of that are there. The most probable question, which I feel that have not been tested, right, in the recent years, is one, there could be a maximum price calculation. Now, in the last two years also, I kept on saying that, you know, they're going to test maximum prices, maximum prices, but they didn't test the calculation area of maximum prices. They tested the theory area. So last two papers, 2020, 2021, you will see there is a theory area on maximum price. But a calculation on maximum prices not tested so far. So can be a question. And again, subsidy. A subsidy was tested in the 2019 old syllabus paper. Apart from that, it has been rarely tested. So maybe they can give you a subsidy calculation. And also, I feel a most probable question is based on elasticity. How does the tax burden and how does the subsidy benefit get divided? When it is elastic, how does it work? When it is inelastic, how does it work? Right? So those kind of things can be thrown at you. And then finally, price stabilization. Now, this was a new addition to your syllabus in 2019. And all of a sudden, the examiner dropped two questions in the 2019 paper itself, which a lot of uh, students face difficulties. They didn't test it after that. In 2020, 2021, there was no price stabilization questions, right? Maybe it can be thrown at you. So I have a small area covering that as well. So if you look at the most commonly tested ones, now here, if you look at SA questions, mostly tested is MCQ. SA questions on taxes, calculation, and also minimum prices, right? Now, if you look at the last four or five years, around three years, the minimum price calculation is what came. So that because minimum price, there are different variations. One is without further government intervention, where the government just comes and sets the minimum price and doesn't do anything after that. Some places, the government comes and purchases the excess supply, price support government. Some places, government gives the deficiency payments. There are three different situations. And all these three situations have been tested by other examiner in the last three to four years. So maybe I feel this year, the examiner might not test minimum prices because it has been tested regularly in the last few years. So this year, I feel maybe a subsidy, maybe a maximum price, but for some reason, examiner has not been testing maximum price at all. At a maximum price calculation for the last 10, 11 years, it has never come. So either the examiner doesn't like that area at all and he doesn't want to question it, or maybe if you're lucky, it will be thrown in in your year. We don't know. And also, same thing with subsidy, right? The examiner doesn't really test much. The 2019 A level old syllabus paper they tested. I have a nice question on that as well, not the calculation on the economic allocative efficiency part of it. We'll discuss. It's a tough area to go through, right? And then they can ask you a very common question, guys, is the effects of different types of intervention. They'll tell you, you know, how does a tax affect economic surplus? So you have to show how far is the consumer surplus before, what's the consumer surplus after, this is how it happened. Yes, these questions are chapter number three. Yeah, this is chapter number three, right? And then uh, these are the main areas, guys. So have a look. We'll get into the chapter directly. Okay. Yes, don't daydream in class. We are doing unit number three. Okay. Right. Then. 
on this case, this is one of the hard area, a new area that the examiner starts to test. I feel it can be tested in your year as well, right? This is based on the 2019 A level paper, the old syllabus question. Okay, they ask you, right, to show allocative efficiency. You now, allocative efficiency, we study in unit number one, right? They connected this concept with a tax and a subsidy. In 2019, they connected it with a subsidy. That's what I'm giving over here. So maybe in your year, they can connect it with a tax. You don't know. That is what I've given you as homework, right? So I'll explain the subsidy area. Then you will understand how to do it for tax. And I put a small YouTube video also, which you can watch. Okay, right. Look at this. There is the market demand curve, right? Listen very carefully, guys. Market demand curve. The market demand curve represents what? It represents the marginal benefit of consumer. Then you have the market supply curve. What does the market supply curve represent? It represents the marginal cost of the supply. So this point over here, right? Where now before the subsidy, okay? This point over here is the point where demand and supply is interacting. So this point over here, QE, the equilibrium point is also known as the allocatively efficient quantity. Why? Because at this quantity, MC and MB are equal to each other, right? Marginal cost, marginal benefit are equal to each other. So this equilibrium quantity we usually say is the allocatively efficient quantity. So the question is asking us, how does a subsidy lead to allocative inefficiency? So how are we going to answer it? Very simple. Listen carefully. Given that there is a subsidy, guys, what happens? Supply curve shifts to the right. So now you have a new supply curve. But if you actually look at it, right? Yes, has the actual marginal cost of the producer changed? Additional cost of producing whatever unit, has that really changed? No, right? Government is giving additional amount, correct? Now, for example, let's say government is telling every tuition teacher, for every student you teach, they will give 500. But does that mean my tuition printing cost is going to go down? Does that mean my Zoom cost is going to go down? No, no. So my additional cost to teaching one of yours is going to be the same. So when you are analyzing, now after the subsidy, we are producing how much of units? This unit, because now the equilibrium is here, right? So when we are analyzing this marginal cost and marginal benefit, okay, after the subsidy, because the cost has not really changed, we still look at marginal cost from the old supply curve perspective. So now we look at now, for example, if let's say this is 150 units. So to produce 150 units, the marginal cost is PF. Let's say it's 15 rupees. But the marginal benefit, right? Now you all know, no, guys, marginal benefit can also be mentioned as price, right? You can substitute it for price. Marginal benefit or the price, let's say, is only, uh, I know, let's say 8 rupees, right? So given that there is a subsidy, what happens, guys? Given that there is a subsidy, right, it leads to a situation where the marginal cost becomes greater than the price. Or in other words, the marginal cost is greater than the marginal benefit. So what is this? There is no allocative efficiency then, right? Allocatively efficient quantity is this. You have to be producing 100, but you are ending up producing how much because the marginal cost is greater than the price right there is kind of a overproduction that happens so you end up producing here you end up producing let's say 150 so that is why we say a subsidy leads to allocating inefficiency right now this has only been tested in the 2019 old syllabus paper this is a question that the examiner can put to you know to make that you don't get the full marks is a question that you don't expect. None of you will expect a question like this. So it can be thrown at you to have a basic idea. So then 
this whole thing is what I've explained, guys. Look at the answer. This is the actual marking schema that you can screenshot here, extract from the markings. So then look at this allocative efficiency of resource allocation after the introduction of a subsystem. Right? Let me read this and let me explain it to you. Okay. They say after the introduction of a subsidy, marginal cost of production exceeds marginal benefit. Now, let me explain this thing. After we introduced the subsidy, marginal cost was here, right? The initial supply curve denotes marginal cost. The demand curve denotes marginal benefit, right? So this is MC, this is MB. So I'm saying, answer, actual answer is saying, marginal cost is exceeding marginal benefit. That's first point. Then they say, right? You don't need someone's videos, and I know I can only see my video because I've been my video. So much, right? So then they say marginal cost of production in this market is higher than the price, right? So you all know, guys, if marginal cost is greater than marginal benefit, you can substitute MB with price. No? So marginal cost is greater than price. Is that okay so far, guys? I'll okay with the first two points. Yes. Step no. Right? So take some time, guys, right? Take some time to go through if you're a little lost and, you know, uh, worried, right? Go, go through this recording again, right? So, I guess I'm explaining again. For those who wanted me to explain again, right? So, okay. So, once again, right? If anyone's videos on, you can opt it, guys. I can't see any videos anyway, right? Right. Once again, demand curve represents marginal benefit. Supply curve represents marginal cost, right? So initially, when the supply and demand are equal to each other, marginal cost, marginal benefit is equal. This is the allocatively efficient quantity, right? That's QE. Let's say in our example, 100 units. After the government gives a subsidy, what happens? MC curve will shift. Sorry, supply curve will shift. Just because the supply increases, does that mean the marginal cost is changed? You remember I told you. Now, in a producer, just because he's getting a subsidy, that does not mean his additional cost of producing a unit is changing. No? His additional cost of producing a unit will still be the same. No? That's why we are still keeping marginal cost in the old supply curve. That's why we compare it with that. So then we say, for the new equilibrium, so this is marginal benefit. This is the marginal cost, right? So now MC is here, MB is here. So marginal cost is greater than marginal benefit. In other words, you can say marginal cost is greater than the price, right? That's the first two points that is there in this diagram, in this answer. Then they say, since marginal cost is greater than price in this market, there is an excess product. Right, so overproduction or too much production due to the subsidy. Market is allocatively inefficient due to the subsidy, and price is not equal to marginal cost and is not equal to marginal. So same thing, guys. How do we shift it if they ask about a tax in your quiz in your A-level paper? Right. So if they ask on a tax, listen carefully. Right. Do you can do it for homework, but listen. Initially. This is the equilibrium quantity, equilibrium price. So this is the ideal allocatively efficient quantity. But what happens, given that there is a tax, what happens? Supply shifts to the left. So now this is the new supply after the tax, right? This is the supply curve initial. Initial supply curve denotes marginal cost. Demand curve represents marginal benefit. So now your equilibrium quantity is this, right? At this quantity, marginal cost is here. Marginal benefit or the price is over here. So in a tax, what you can do is, you can show the opposite guys. You can say that marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. Or in other words, the price is greater than marginal cost. They're charging a price that is higher than the marginal cost. Therefore, the good is underproduced, right? Underproduced or underconsumed. Therefore, it leads to allocative inefficiency. So, same thing 
it's the opposite so take some time guys right now these are things that you have to take some time and figure it out on your end because this is like the this very end of the paper which i don't know if it will be tested but if the examiner is going to put a hard question this can be one yeah is that okay Steph, can you take some time right the recording will be also be available right go through the 2019 a level question go through the marking scheme see how you can put this into a uh what how you can put this into a what situation of allocative efficiency Here it's the underproduction, right? Now in this situation, it's overproduction, right? Now here it's underproduction. So you have to be uh, producing at this point, allocatively efficient point, but you are producing only here, no? So you are producing less. So the overproduction, underproduction, guys, comes based on the point where you are producing. So initial equilibrium is the allocatively efficient point. Yeah. So. Your allocatively efficient where your marginal cost equals marginal benefit. So that is this point. But when you are here, MC is here, MB is here. So this quantity is not allocatively efficient. Right? So this is where it's allocatively efficient. Okay? So take some time, guys. Take some time uh, and try and figure that out. Okay? Yes, subsidy taxes. Guys, remember, whenever the government intervenes, it leads to allocative inefficiency. Whenever government intervenes the free market, right, it leads to allocative inefficiency. That is also corrected or dead weight loss later, but we'll not go into that detail. Okay. Is that it? Yes, go to the answer. Yeah, fast paper book answers are correct, guys. They don't print it wrong. So Atlas book also answers should be okay. Okay, right. Then we get into the next question. That is a maximum price calculation. Right. The first parts are very easy, guys. Can you all quickly give me the? We can. You can. We can skip this also, right? But uh, we'll do it for the sake of doing it today, right? So there is. They say in a competitive coconut market, demand and supply equations are given QDQS, equilibrium price and quantity, uh, consumer surplus. This one, guess these parts you can do it at home in detail, right? But can you give me the answers for this so that I can actually uh, do the next part of the question? Anyone who did it? Equilibrium price, quantity, price 30, okay. Equilibrium quantity. Now, I don't have to teach you all equilibrium price and quantity. How much is quantity? Quantity is also 30. Yeah. Okay. So, price and quantity both are 30. Okay. Uh, this one, consumer surplus, produce surplus at equilibrium. Maybe you can do it at home. Right. So, I'll just uh, show the diagram for you. Mm, okay. So, these you can do at home, guys. I'll just try to show you how to do the maximum price calculation okay right so there is demand there is supply you all told me equilibrium price and quantity are both 30 and 30 right so i mark 30 over here i mark 30 over here so they are saying government is introducing a maximum price of 22 right so government is coming maybe they feel that the price is too high and they put a maximum price of 22 so now they are asking, right? Now this is the maximum price question. Find the amount of excess demand in the market. So how do you find the excess demand, guys? So at the price of twenty-two, find how much is the quantity supplied. Is the supply curve? Find how much is the quantity demanded. Then you can find the excess demand. No. So what's our equation? QD equals this. QS equals this. So QD equals. Mm, hold on. QD equals 90 minus 2P. So how do you find the demand, guys? So QD will equal to 90 minus 2 into uh, 22. So QD is equal to 90 minus 2 into 2 is 44. So QD will equal to 
forty. How much is our quantity supplied at the price of twenty two? Q S equals minus sixty plus three into twenty two. So Q S is equal to minus sixty plus twenty two into three is ah uh, sixty six. So Q S is equal to six. No? Yeah, right. So then, what are the numbers that we get, guys? Q S is equal to six. Q D is equal to forty six. That is a common question that you can get. Then, how much is our excess demand? Excess demand equals Q D minus Q S. That is forty six minus six. You get forty. Everyone okay with that case? Yeah. Forty six minus six, you get forty. Okay, so we have excess demand of forty. Right. Then they are asking you. Okay, so in very simple case, there is no rocket science here, right? Just there is a maximum price. So they are asking you because of this maximum price, what is the excess demand? So simple thing, what you have to do is. At this price, find how much is the quantity supplied. Use the Q S equation. Find how much is quantity demanded. Use the Q D equation. So once you find that, you realize look here, there is an excess demand of forty units, right? Then the next one, guys, calculate the maximum black. Sorry, calculate the black market price after the maximum control price. Usually, when they say black market price, guys, they are referring to the maximum black market price, right? So, what is the maximum black market price? The maximum black market price is when you connect this to the demand equation, right? The one over here, right? So, the maximum black market price is right. So, Q D equals ninety minus two P. So, in order to buy what? In order to buy six units. Right now, QD is six. No, you have to find when the QD when the price is what is the QD six to buy six units. What is the price consumers are willing to pay? That's what you have to find. So QD is six ninety minus two P. I'll take the two P into this side. Two P equals ninety minus six. Two P equals eighty four. P is equal to forty. Is that okay? Maximum black market. Step. Okay. Then the third one. Calculate consumer producer and economic surplus. Right. Before we calculate consumer producer surplus, yes. Can you all tell me what is the maximum demand price and the minimum supply price on these? I'm not going to teach you. Right. You all should know. Maximum demand price is the price when QD equals zero, so forty five. Okay. Minimum supply price when supply is zero, twenty. Right. Okay. So these right basic guys. If you are lost with this, right, I don't know what you all were doing for the last two years. Right. So then, now in my question, right, have I told? The consumer has to bear an extra cost. Consumer has to stand in queues and spend some extra time. Have I told something like that? No, right. I'm silent. I have not told anything like that. So in a situation like that, if the examiner is silent, which area is consumer surplus? Consumer surplus is this entire trapezium-like area. This is consumer surplus. And which area is produce a surplus? This triangle over here. If the question says, right, be very careful. If the question specifically says, look here, the consumer has now because of the black market price, because there is a shortage and all, consumer has to now spend extra time finding for goods. They have to stand in queues. They might have to pay bribes. If that happens. Then remember, guys, consumer surplus is only this small. I'll highlight it in yellow. It's only this small triangle. But if the examiner is silent, if he has not mentioned about a price uh, 
standing in queues, then you take the entire black area. So in my question, have I mentioned anything about a queue or anything? No. So therefore, you take the entire black area. Then. Right. So now it's a matter of doing your maths, guys. What's the area of consumer surplus? How do you find the area of a trapezium, guys? You add the two perpendicular heights. So one height is 42 minus 22. That is this. One, one is this. Let me show this to you in the black one, right? One is this, one is this, right? So one height is 45 minus 22 is 23. Understand which part? Yeah, come. 23. This part is 20. So this plus this divided by 2 multiplied by this height, right? Multiplied by this. So that is how much, guys? That is uh, 6 units. So, how much do we get, guys? When you solve 23 plus 20 divided by 2 into 6, I think you should get like a, a decimal. How much do we get? And you get this, my you get a full number. Okay. Right, so, you should get 129. Is that okay? Fine. Import, import the shortage. No, it's not a minus. So if they import the shortage, then consumer surplus would be this entire part. If they import, if they say there is an import and if there is a uh, world market supply curve, right? If they show that there is a world market supply curve here, then this entire thing is consumer surplus. Produce surplus till the Okay. Yes, consumer surplus is this the red thing here. Sorry, not red thing, the black trapezium like area. I guess I'm finding oh, okay, wait a minute. Yes, I'm finding the area of a trapezium, right? So your basic calculation, how do you find the area of a trapezium, guys? You take the two parallel heights, right? So this height is 42 minus 20, 45 minus 22, that is 23. This height is 42 minus 22, that is 20. That's how I got the two heights here, this arrow and this arrow, right? So I took the two heights, I divided it by two, right? That's how you find, that's the equation, that's maths, that's, math, that's not equal, right? And I multiply it by this one. That's the bit. So then you get 129. When it's imported, no, when it's imported, there will not be a dead weight loss. Okay, how much is the producer surplus case? We'll do that and I'll clarify any other question. How much is our producer surplus? That's a small triangle there, right? That's easy, you know, guys. Half into, right? What is our base? Base is 6. Height is 22 minus uh, 20. That's 2. So that's equal to 6. And then what is our economic surplus? It's consumer surplus plus producer surplus. So 129 plus 6, you get 135. Is, that, is it always a happy thing? Okay, this is not black market calculation, it's a maximum price calculus, right? So how do you get the black market price, guys? Black market price is what is the price consumer is willing to pay to buy these six units? The suppliers are supplying only six units at the price of 22. Supply is supplying only six. So to buy six units, what is the price consumer is willing to pay? So you take the QD equation, right? Put six to the QD, that means to buy six units. What is the price they are going to pay? And then you solve it, you get 42. So consumers are going to pay 42 rupees to buy 60. That's how you get the maximum black market price. I don't think they will go to the extent of putting an import in it. Okay, so don't worry. Right? I don't think a unit three question will talk about an the import. They will not make it that advanced. So let's leave the import part 
for now. They have not even tested black market prices, I don't think. It may come, I don't know, but I don't feel it's a very important part for a final sentence. Yeah, so then which one is your dead weight loss? Right? Your dead weight loss, guys, is this area, because I'm not going to do the calculation. Can you please calculate it? 240? Yeah, the area of this triangle. So some of you are saying dead weight loss is 240, is it? Yes. So dead weight loss, guys, also you can explain it using, you can say that look here, this is the market efficient quantity, right? 30 units. But because of this maximum price, now only six units are produced and sold in the market. So there is the underproduction and it leads to dead weight loss of this much. If you have to give a small explanation, you can do that. Okay. No, dead weight loss and loss of economic surplus is different. Okay, right. Yes, recording of this, I will upload for the registered students on the website. It's like the hundredth time I've been telling this. Yes, dead weight loss is simply area of a triangle, guys. There is no equation to memorize. You simply half into uh, what is the height? Height is 42 minus 22, that's 20. What is the base? 30 minus 6 is 24. So you find. So if they ask you to explain the story of a dead weight loss, guys, you might have to. Uh, you can talk about the allocatively efficient quantity and the quantity that they are producing in the market. That kind of thing you can show. No, if the consumer stand in the queue also, we will go with the same dead weight loss. You calculate for black market price. No, no, so we don't we are we are expecting that the market is efficient and the consumers are only paying 22. There is no black market and end. Change in economic surplus and dead weight loss is different. Social welfare loss and dead weight loss is the same. Okay. Yes, I there is an interesting question in the 2021 paper. I have omitted it because I feel it will not be repeated in the 2022 paper. Right. So go to the 2022 paper, question number three. And on how they have looked at uh, dead weight loss, right? For the question number three part, I think I got it, some part, right? In the calculation, the last calculation that talks about dead weight loss, they have an interesting argument. I would have explained this in, uh, I think, in a mock exam series, some part also. For those who are there, you should have, should have some idea about it. Right? But I feel it's not very important because it was tested last year. It's very unlikely they will repeat it, but they can, right? Because if, if a lot of people have got it wrong last year, then they might put it this year as well. But unlikely, we don't know. So you can just go and have a look. Okay? Right. Is that okay, guys? So go through. I'll give you all more questions to practice in the... Uh, remember, I told you all, I'll give you all some model questions to practice. So in that, I'll give you all more, uh, more maximum price questions so that you all can practice, okay? I'll give you all the questions. The answers will also be there, all right? Is that fine? Okay, right. Then we'll... Uh, Right. Shall we get into price stabilization then? That's the, another interesting part. And then we have this part that you all can have a read at home. And then I have given additional practice questions for all the taxes, subsidies, everything. This import supply curve, I feel, is not important. That's why I omitted it. I don't think it will be tested in unit number three. Maybe in unit number uh, what, nine or ten, when I touch on it, I'll touch on it a little if I feel it's important. Because I don't feel it's important. So don't worry. I don't think they would put it on an essay question, maybe a MCQ. Okay? Right. Right. Then we'll get into this topic, guys. We'll get into this topic of uh which fun. We'll get into this topic of right, let me put the chat down to me on. Yeah. Okay. Right. I get all nonsense messages here and there. Never mind. Okay. So we get into price stabilization, right? So uh in terms of price stabilization, with the dead weight loss change? No, dead weight loss will not change. If the consumer stand in Q, the dead weight loss is going to be the same because dead weight loss, now we look at it 
it's the difference between the allocatively efficient point and what you actually produce. So even if the consumers stand in queue, it's going to be the same number, right? Then we'll get into uh, price stabilization, guys. It can be tested. It might not be tested. We don't know, right? So listen very carefully. It's a little bit of a new area for some of you all. And this is a question that was there in the 2019 A-level paper, okay? So mainly if you look at price stabilization, now what is price stabilization in the first place? Yes, price stabilization is where the prices of a good is not changing. It's not either increasing or not decreasing. Now that's a good thing to have, right? You should not have prices always going up and down. Then there is no price stabilization. So price stabilization is where the price in the market is stable. Now, especially this problem comes for agricultural goods. Now, if you look at agricultural goods, guys, the demand for agricultural goods are inelastic. Why? Right? Now, you think of something like rice, guys, right? Demand is inelastic, no? And think of the supply. Supply of rice is also inelastic. You can't increase the supply just because the price increase. Can you increase supply of rice today? No. So, demand and supply for agricultural goods, guys, are inelastic, right? So given that it is inelastic, you have a price. So now you know what happens. Even if a small change takes place, right, it will cause a huge change in the price. Now that's why we say prices of agricultural goods. Now, now you all know, right, just go to the market and see when you all go to Cargill's, when you all go to, you know, maybe somewhere to buy your vegetables, Today's price is not the price that you will see tomorrow, no? Today you will have 100 grams this much, tomorrow they'll say something else. So why is it always changing? Why are these prices always today 100, tomorrow 50, next day 200? Why? Right? The reason is because there is inelastic demand and supply. Even if there is a small change in the demand or supply. Just see, let's assume, right now let's assume this is our initial supply curve, right? Let's say for some reason, the harvest was good. Let's say, you know, the uh, rain was good, sunlight was there, good harvest, therefore supply increased. So can you see, right? Let's say 100 kilos, right? 100 kilos of, let's say, supply of rice went to 110 kilos. Small, right? 100 kilos of supply went to 110. So supply increased because of a good harvest. But see what happened to the price in the market now. Price which was, let's say, uh, 200 a kilo, now has gone down drastically, right? So that is why these agricultural prices are volatile, guys. And now see, if for some reason, if the supply increases, decreases a little, let's say a small decrease in the supply, right? If you look at this, see, supply from 100 units has gone to like 95. But look at the change in the price, a big change in the price. And now you will wonder, sir, this supply, right? This supply of this and this. Adan, I don't hear it, so I'll continue, right? So, uh, what? If you look at these prices, right? If you look at the supply, now the supply of these agricultural goods, guys, you can't control it. Now, can you control when you plant rice or something, right? Let's say you plant your paddy. Can you control and say we are going to get 100 kilos this time? Can you control it? You can't, right? There can be natural disasters. There can be too much of rain. There can be a drought. Sometimes, you know, something has happened. Your, your fertilizer has been good. Your harvest is high. So you can't really control this supply, you know? It's not easy to control this supply. Exactly. Elephants can destroy, right? Weather conditions, right? There can be so much of things. Yeah, I've spoken of it, right? Weather, droughts, other factors, availability of fertilizer, all of it affects your supply. So you don't have any control over the supply. So therefore, the supply changes. Let's say for some reason, now it has not rained for one month. Now your crop might die. Maybe for some reason, let's say, you know, your harvest has become very good because the sun has come out, right? Supply might increase. So very frequently supply can change. The moment the supply changes, given that the supply is inelastic, can you see? A small change. Now, the supplies earlier were supplying 100 kilos. Now, they're supplying just 105. 
at a small change causes a huge reduction in the price. That's why we say the prices of agricultural crops are often unstable in the market or what, how they are volatile. Is that clear, guys? Yes. Why the prices are volatile? So, what can the government now do? Now, it's volatile. We understand the prices of these goods are always volatile and, you know, always changing. So, now what can the government do to make sure that the prices are stable? So, what can the government do then? One is, they can introduce a guaranteed price. Scheme. Now, for example, look at this. Let's say, right? Now, there, there is a very interesting question, right? Uh, there is a statement, right? In economics, we say, a farmer, right? Maybe this can be tested in your paper. A farmer kills himself, right? Over a good harvest. What is this? What does this mean? What if they give you a statement like this all of a sudden and you know you're like shaka boom? What are you gonna answer? They say that there is a news headline that said a price that a farmer kills himself over a good harvest. Explain. You remember myself, you remember my parents, you remember your teacher, you remember everyone. What are you going to do now? What's the logic? What's the story here? Think, guys. Think what happens when the farmer gets a good harvest. Think. Why is he killing himself? Why is he, if they say a farmer hangs himself because of a good harvest, why? Because the moment the farmer has a good harvest, right? Let's say the uh, trees grow well and everything comes. A good harvest, that means the supply increasing. Can you see? Causes a huge fall in his price. So remember, price into quantity is total revenue, no? The earlier his total revenue is the orange area. This is the price, this is the quantity. But now because of the good harvest, what happened? The price went down so much, right? Now his total revenue is the red area. So can you see? Because of a good harvest, given that the price goes down so bad, right? It negatively affects the farmer. That's the whole story about the farmer killing himself over a good harvest. So now, the government has to take action, guys. Now, because a good harvest is something that you can't prevent, no, right? Just because the, let's say the harvest comes, you can't tell to destroy it or something. That's a government has to do something, right? So what can the government do? Now, remember, here we are talking about a reduction in price. Now, if the price reduces, bad for the farmer. If the supply decreases, price increases, bad for the consumer, right? So, increasing is also a problem, decreasing is also a problem. Ideally, you have to keep it at a stable level. So, one thing you can do is, government can set a guaranteed price. So, now, for example, you know, if the supply increases, right? If the supply increases, what will happen? Farmer would face a huge loss. So, he might even kill himself. So, what the government does is, government sets the Guaranteed minimum price. So, government says, look here, for every kilo of rice, guaranteed price is 60. So, even if the harvest is great, still the farmer will still get a guaranteed price of 60. That's one way the government can intervene and solve this problem. What is the other way? Government can put a deficiency payment. So, connected to this. So, when the harvest is high, government will say, okay, right, we will give you 60, but the market can't price is only, let's say, uh, 30, government pays the balance. Fine, farmer is happy, no problem. Then, fixing a quota and limiting the supply. The government tells the farmer, look here, right, you don't go and produce like a pool, right, produce only 100 kilos, you know, right, I will give you a quota. So, government says the government puts a quota on the farm, this thing. They put a quota. So they say, look here, right? Your supply has to only be 100 kilos. Don't go and supply more. If you supply more, you eat rice all five times a day even. I'm not going to put it to the market. They can put a quota like that and they can limit the supply. So if they limit the supply, then supply won't change. The price will be the same. Government will purchase the excess supply. That's under, under number one. Okay? Then government can pay the farmer to discourage cultivation. Now, what happens if the 
if the farmer cultivates so much, if he cultivates like a lot, then if the supply increases, then what happens? Then the price would go down. So the government will say, look here, farmer, right? You don't uh, what go and cultivate. You limit your production, right? I will give you money. If you want money, I will give you. But you don't go and supply like a fool, right? You limit your production. The government itself pays the farmer and discourages his supply. Because if he goes and supplies, what happens? Price goes down. That's number four. Then the government can accumulate and release buffer stock. Now, for example, now what is this buffer stock story? Let's say the ideal quantity is 100 kilos. If the farmer puts 110 kilos, it's going to cause a huge fall in the price. So what the government will do, guys, is government will then purchase that excess 10 kilos, right? They will purchase it. So that is what you say of accumulating of buffer stock. Let's say some reason supply fell. If supply falls, the price will go up. No. So then what the government can do? If they have accumulated anything, then they will put it out. They will release it. Exactly. So then they will release the buffer stock. So by accumulating and releasing buffer stock, what does the government do? They try to keep the supply at the same 100, unit, 100 kilos and keep the price stable. Is that fine? Buffer stock. That can be a question that can come. They can directly put your question on buffer stock only. So do some reading. Okay. Then, mm, right. So they can provide export subsidies. So they can tell the farmer, don't release all your products to Sri Lanka. Right. You only put 100 kilos to Sri Lanka. Please send the remaining into another country. Right. That's exporting sub, export subsidies. Right. Then uh, provide accurate information. So government can tell, look, your farmer, Sri Lanka, we only need 100 kilos of rice. Please don't go and supply more. If you supply more, price will fall. It's going to be a problem for you. So please go and right do what? Please go and supply only 100 kilos. So if the government can provide accurate information to them, then also it is sorted. Then uh, you can provide subsidies for inputs, right? Uh, government can back insurance schemes for any natural hazards. Those are there, but have an idea about the main one. So uh, buffer stock, again, guys, in very simple terms, what is a buffer stock? A buffer stock is where the government is purchasing and releasing. Now, ideal market quantity is 100 kilos. By any chance, if the harvest was good and the supply increases, what will the government do? They will purchase that excess stock. That's what you call a buffer stock. Where government accumulates buffer stock. They buy that excess. So they don't let the supply increase. They try to keep, now, ideal supply is 100 kilos. So if the fellow puts, farmer puts 110 kilos, they purchase the 10 kilos and keep it there. That's a accumulating buffer stock. Yes, you had it in the Matala airport all. Exactly. Right. So let's say the supply goes to decrease. Let's say bad harvest. They put only 90 kilos to the market. Then problem no. Then what the government does, whatever buffer stock they have bought and kept, they will release. So there is accumulating buffer stock and releasing buffer stock. Accumulating means you buy if there is an excess. Releasing means if there is a shortage, you put out whatever you have. And that way, you somehow try and keep the supply at this level. You don't let it decrease. You don't let it increase as well. Uh, we don't talk too much about a change in demand because the change, I don't think the demand for these goods change much, right? Because if you look at agricultural goods, rice and all, we still buy them, in, right? It's essential goods and right? there is no much change. So not that important. Okay. So have an idea about all of that, guys. It can, guys, these are the most tricky questions that they can ask, right? The most obvious questions. That's why I said at the very beginning of today's class, please do your past papers, right? So the seminar I'm covering the tricky questions, the hard ones, that and that. Uh, deficiency payment, guys, that's a different story. You are a little unsure. Uh, a deficiency payment, I don't know. I don't know how to explain that in a few words, but maybe after class, say I'll clarify. Government might purchase at the same price, providing subsidies for input. These are not that important. Government back insurance scheme, you can know also. You need not pay. Okay? Right. Yes, fast papers are not that hard, guys. Don't worry. 
Now we get into the last, last area. Now this area, I'm not going to talk too much, guys, but I feel there can be a, a essay question that can come from this area. Give me a second. Okay. This one, right? Based on the tax incidence and elasticity. Now there are so many situations that they can give, guys. So all what you have to do is you have to know how to practically draw this. Right? You can't memorize each of these diagrams. You have to know how to draw. So I would have taught this multiple number of times. Right? Whoever you all learned under would have taught you multiple number of times. How does uh, each one of these work? Right? For example, if there is inelastic demand, you need to draw inelastic demand. And then when there is a sub uh, tax, what happens? Supply sits to the left. And then you should be able to find how much is the consumer tax burden how much is the producer tax burden, who is bearing more, you should be able to draw the diagram. So usually, if they give you a question like this, if it's a four mark question, at least two mark will be for the correct diagram. So I will include certain questions on, yes, high elasticity, high the tax burden, that's the, short, that's the short form, but you know, you can't write that in the explanation. So do go through the area, guys. So like I said, I'll give you all a few model questions once the seminar is done for you all to practice. I'll give you all a few model questions, right? Uh, in those, I will include questions like this as well. I'll give you all the question and the answer you can read, you can write, okay? So have an idea about this, right? Different types of elasticities and how the tax burden is divided and also how the subsidy benefit is divided based on elasticity. So if it is inelastic, who gets the more benefit? If the demand uh, demand is elastic, who gets the higher benefit, right? So likewise, there are so many situations, right? There is no, uh, but you can't memorize all the diagrams. You have to practically draw again. So please take some time to practice how to draw those diagrams, how to find which area is the consumer benefit, which area is the producer benefit, right? How do you draw elastic? How do you draw inelastic demand curve, right? The shape of it. So do take some time and practice. It can be a very highly tested question. I'm also very excited to see your actual paper. I'm just wondering, you know, what if at least what I predicted whether it would come. I don't know. But, you know, excited to see what your paper is. Maybe once you all do the A-level paper, send me a picture. Right? Uh, yeah, that's about uh, this thing. Mm, if the question mentions elastic demand, nothing about supply. Yes, you can draw a normal supply. Graph. Okay? Right. And then, guys, I have given uh, practice questions. So there is a practice question for calculation uh, for taxes, subsidies, uh, max minimum prices, right? Minimum prices without government intervention, minimum prices with price support government purchase, and minimum prices with deficiency payment. Maximum price I did know, so I did put a question on that. And yeah, and the answers are also there in case there is a calculation error. Once again, guys, let me know on the group or at least text me personally. I'll correct it because I made this overnight. So there can be uh, numbers that I have added and subtracted or multiplied and divided wrong. So if there is, do let me know. I will make the correction and I will inform everyone else as well. Okay. So yeah, that is basically it with unit one, two, and three. Those are the most probable areas, guys. So once again, the tip, remember the final seminar, we're still in day one, right? What do I cover? I only cover the main, right? I only cover the I maybe it can come. So I also have different instincts. So I only covered unit one, two, three. And again, guys, I covered only the main areas, most probable areas. So there are areas that is not in that unit that can be tested because I'm also not God, right? I don't know what exactly would come, but based on my analysis, those are the most important is I feel that can come. So on your end, right? Make sure that you do all the past papers, guys. Just like I explained at the very beginning of the session, do all the past papers and get that done. Next session is on Friday, the 6th of Jan. Uh, we will do unit 4, 5, and 6. And then uh, session 3, you can do this, statistics and the current issues, session 4 and session 5. With that, it will uh, finish off. So this is the free session, guys. So this session was free for anyone. I'm hoping that you all learned something. Remember, guys, unit 1, 2, and 3 has 90 marks in your paper. So focus and get that done. And then the others, guys, if you're planning to continue, 
you can pay the fee of 3200 and you can do it so in addition to all of this once you pay the fee and register you get access to all the other additional material as well all the past paper recordings from 2015 2021 right the difficult areas the past paper analysis the model papers right you get all of it on the uh, lms website once you pay and register for the free session it was just unit number one two and three so yes 21 byc i'll upload it probably by today it should be available okay so that's it the details and everything is there guys in the pdf that right? you all can go through all those who are pay and register just check if you are added into a new group okay so this recording yes i'll upload and i'll give it to you all. Okay. so see you and have a nice nice day i'll see the see most of you all on uh friday other guys if you have questions do stay and clarify see you and have a nice day. see you guys